Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, first of our speaker series for the fall of 2022, the uh, IPM seminar series. We have quite an audience here today, and we're great to have our first speaker, which is Dean Maureen Litchfeld. Maureen is Dean of the School of Public Health, Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health, and the Jonas Salt Chair in Population Health School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. Very excited to have Maureen speak because when she was recruited here, in many of the original um, words that went out, she talked a lot about precision public health as one of the um, things that she's going to focus on. So I was excited now to have her come and speak at our series and um, tell us about some of the exciting things that she's going to do. Maureen is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, um, and she has nearly 40 years of experience of environmental public health. She has national and global global environmental health research, which examines the cumulative impact of chemical and non-chemical stresses on community and environmental health threats, disasters, including pandemics and health disparities. Previously, she spent 15 years at Tulane University and then 18 years with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the US Department of Health and Human Services Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry. There, she designed public health research tools and protocols adopted by all states nationwide to guide national environmental health studies in communities living near hazardous waste sites. Uh, Maureen is a widely respected research and scholar. She serves on numerous boards, including the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, the Board on Global Health and the One Health Action Collaborative. I'm happy to have her speak today and excited to hear what Maureen's gonna tell us about precision public health. Maureen, thank you. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you for um, having me. This is such an important um, speaker series, and I'm honored to be that first speaker. Um, so to make sure that everybody knows there's no war going on between precision medicine and specific precision public health, but rather there's a lot of um, common ground. And so let's see where we go to the next slide here. Okay, so um, we really strive in precision medicine to deliver the right intervention to the right patient at the right time. So similarly, in precision public health, we seek to deliver the right intervention to the right population at the right time. And so, and Maureen Khoury is actually a very old friend when we were at CDC together, and he really began to build that stage of, of precision public health. So if we juxtaposition for precision medicine and precision public health, we know that in precision medicine, we're trying to be as integrated and broad and take into account from genes all the way to translation, what's going on in the individual. Similarly, we could do that kind of fingerprinting in a community. So in that context, we want to know what's going on in terms of food deserts or where uh, disasters and, and um, we have hurricanes happening. Um, and in Puerto Rico, we have uh, in the Caribbean. So we want to know those things. But we also want to know where there are persistent and historic burdens of health disparities, where we have increases in factor-borne diseases because of climate and health um, and climate change where we have increases in pollution and we don't have to go very far uh, in Pennsylvania, including in Allegheny County and in Beaver County to know where our pollution areas are. And in general, what our welfare state looks like and um, towards the end of the presentation, my last part of the presentation, I'll be talking about uh, life expectancy. So then um, how does population health benefits from precision medicine, but how that in turn requires public health. It's truly a public health imperative to know what's going on um, in, and to support the, the advances and to benefit from the advances in, in precision medicine. Um, newborn screening is an excellent example of that and how we integrate uh, things like newborn screening in public health policies. Um, we also want to ensure that precision medicine discoveries can lead to better health outcomes for all people, particularly also for people where there are existing 
and persistent burdens of health inequities. And so our public health actions can be centered on population specific needs and outcomes. And there we do what is called an, an asset and gap analysis and see um, where the evidence is bringing us. So without really a concerted public health action, um, advances in public uh, in precision medicine um, can be hampered um, uh, and can be, um, not only can be hampered, but actually can even exacerbate population health disparities. And that's not where we want to go. And so within public, uh, within the School of Public Health and within public health, um, Adrian is right. When I uh, when I came to uh, the family, when I became part of the family uh, of the University of Pittsburgh, this was one of my four strategic imperatives. Um, precision public health is about making science work for communities by investigating population specific data and informing uh, to inform the right interventions to the right populations. Um, we harness, and this is very important because we all know that epi epidemiological studies can be very expensive and expansive and um, can take a long time. So we harness both primary and secondary data and we do that at the intersection of society and technology. And so our approach um, to precision public health is that it's transdisciplinary in nature and hence I was very excited to be uh, invited by Adrian um, to be part of this, this broader health sciences discipline. Um, it is data informed and technology driven by integrating, as I mentioned before, individual health data with community population specific data. So the idea is that we create a community profile just like in precision medicine, you create an individual patient profile. Um, and do that in a data-driven way by creating a geospatial twin, and I'll get to that in a, in a minute, um, where then ultimately we bring together two sets of data, a data twin of individual data and community-specific data to benefit both. Almost 10 years ago, or maybe eight years ago now, we started this in a very focused but much smaller way when we looked at the exposome in environmental health and transformed that in the public health exposome. And as you can see, the, um, the focus on that top um, bucket to the left, the, the typical things that, we, things that we do, we look at genetics, the typical precision medicine pieces, but also issues like uh, epigenetics. Um, and all the omics and behaviors and the psychosocial factors as it is factors that are truly personal. Um, in the context of environmental health, we would then look at what the chemical stressors are. But what we haven't done and haven't integrated as much as we currently are doing with the precision public health component are the, are the aspects of within the community that constitute risk factors or constitute assets, such as the natural built social and policy environment. And I'll come back to that. And so um, what we are exploring is what are the exposures, not only the physical exposures, but what are some of the risk factors that individuals are exposed to in, the, in connection with their environment? And how is that those sets of risk factors influencing a person's health in a community and a community's health um, throughout the lifespan. And then looking particularly at the moderating factors, and that's where precision public health plays a key role of social support, of the assets, of access, and indeed in, in individual um, pre-existing conditions. So ultimately, what we're looking at is what's the iterative nature of risk factors or beneficial factors that influence both personal health outcomes and population health outcomes. And so those community indicators, if you would, if this would be an individual, this would, this would be that first picture that I showed you of whether we look at genes and everything that's going on in the individual. Well, this is going on in a community and in a community, 
critical things are issues of transportation. If a person doesn't have good transportation to access healthcare, we could be as advanced as we want in the context of precision medicine, but we won't get there. Um, same thing goes for housing. And for example, um, the conditions indoor, indoor air conditions and childhood asthma or uh, COPD, um, whether a person has, is employed or not, what the health literacy level is of, of the person, um, issues of public safety. Uh, we have a mayor whose singular focus almost from a public health perspective is, is gun violence. Um, issues of income, how, how we connect with the health system, how communities, particularly those of color and underserved connect with the health system and what is the health of the environment because the health of the environment and the health of people um, are inextricably linked. So in our design of, of the, our precision public health collaboratory, um, we have within, within our, our family of the University of Pittsburgh, we have a ton of assets and, and some of those, and I could go on the entire presentation to talk about the assets and the expertise and the data sets that we currently have within the University of Pittsburgh, as well as the partners that we have beyond our academic institutions, UPMC is a critical partner. We have partnerships with state and local health departments, with foundations, with industry, and with tech ventures as well. But then there are the gaps for us to get to truly operationalizing and implementing uh, precision public health. Um, to what extent do we have access to the kind of data that we need? Not the individual data, but the community data. Um, to what extent do we know what baseline is? Um, for example, we are working with the Allegheny County Health Department. Um, we're, um, we're creating for the first time baseline data, both by a specimen as well as baseline environmental data before the cracker plant is coming into place. So what kind of baseline data do we have of our population that we could say more about exposure to X causes disease Y? Can we make really that, that causal association. Um, and even if the data are there, often the databases are not linked or they're not longitudinal in, in, um, in nature. There are just snapshots, a uh, one-time data collection, or they're not real time. We have a ton of expertise, as I mentioned, in terms of the asset, but we're lacking the expertise to integrate the kind of tools um, that and apply and deploy the kind of tools that we need to truly create this collaboratory that's, that is technology driven, that has a number of stakeholders and communities. Um, and then ultimately as part of this, our collaboratory, um, we are looking forward to investing in incubator and innovation grants. Um, and I'll talk a bit about our seed grants currently, um, in adult professorships and in student scholarship so that ultimately one component and an important component of this aspect is commercialization. We're taking this um, in a phased approach, although I'm an inpatient person as, as some of you have come to learn. Um, but in this phased approach, we're beginning with developing um, a digital platform and integrating publicly available secondary data, even before we start to do any elegant research, so to speak, um, at the neighborhood level so that um, we know about the social determinants of health. We're able to integrate mortality and morbidity data in a publicly accessible data platform. We had an initial gift um, uh, from one of our um, uh, alums to begin to create this um, data platform. The second phase would be to develop a blueprint um, to enable external use in one or two locations. And Allegheny County is one of the first, the first location that we're focusing on. And ultimately in the third phase to make this um, naturally accessible. And then it would provide a foundation for us to do the kinds of research that we're all excited about. And so um, this is the first of the mock-ups of um, how this would look like in a person's hand on a cell phone, on some other mobile device that 
just like they can get their own data from the electronic health record, we want them to have their own data uh, of what their particulate matter PM 2.5 looks like um, in the in the county. And this is this is the social determinants of health. This is Allegheny County. Um, what the poverty index is, what the housing status is, um, what the walkability is. Um, and what the situation is with unemployment, obesity, and food deserts. And so this is, these are the 14 term, social determinants of health available um, for Allegheny County and how that county ranks. And so I mentioned to you that uh, we have started um, in a small way, but with great leadership um, from my colleague, um, Dr. Stephen Rees, um, the, the head of CPSI to create a set of pilot projects. We had significant um, interest. We put it out there and we had 22 applications in a few uh, months and through rigorous review, five pilot projects were selected. And here you see part of the, the, the listing of the five and the titles and the, the pairs that um, we, required, we require that it's come from two different schools, in this case, medicine and public health. And if this was a pair of investigators that had never worked together, I added um, another 5,000 on top of the, the seed grant. And so we had five, and in, in fact, um, just a, a couple of hours ago today, we were briefed on where they stand. And so Alison Sanders and Jackie Ho are using a mouse model to look at the impact of heat um, on um, uh, kidney function and particularly chronic kidney disease of unknown origin, ability to transform that into um, the human population and looking at from a climate perspective, um, the impact of heat on um, kidney function in humans. Um, Ying Ding and Eric Forno are looking at asthma and using um, electronic health records to do that precision kind of care not only at the individual, but at the community level um, and how we can inform using secondary data, using the environmental health um, record, um, emergency health record data um, to, um, to be even more precise in, in where the address population is. Um, similarly, um, from a genomic epi perspective with HPMV, um, Anna and Mark are, um, looking at how we use AI to be able to map more of the genomic um, areas and how to, um, uh, uh, these are um, samples, RNA samples from Japan and how, what, how it is applicable for our, um, for populations here in our country. Um, Jibao and Victor are looking at precision um, medicine and pu precision public health methods in Alzheimer's disease and looking at that genetic pattern. Um, and then uh, Stina and Christina um, are looking at the social determinants and the structural determinants of sep sepsis risk. So here is a really good example of individual um, risk and how the social determinants of health influence that individual risk. So let me use two examples. Um, one is on cardiovascular disease in general. Um, this is way out of my um, comfort zone because I don't do basic science, but you get the, you get the drift. Uh, we do in precision medicine uh, from a cardiovascular perspective, um, we look at the genomic sequencing. We, we look at how we can transform pluripotent um, stem cells and ultimately do this kind of fingerprinting at the individual level. Now, we can do the same kind of fingerprinting at the community level. And there, um, our genetics and genomics work focuses on economic stability, on neighborhood, on education, on whether or not this is a food desert, or the community and the social context, ultimately all of those, um, whether it's individual health behaviors or issues of structural racism, um, implicit bias or un unhealthy living conditions, um, influence hypertension, 
um, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, obesity, um, as the kind of the initial phases of ultimately what will lead to more, um, uh, more significant cardiovascular disease. So you see how we can fingerprint at the individual level genetically, and we can fingerprint at the community level in a given disease. The, the push here is that we can do whatever we want in that individual. If we send that individual back in an environment that is not, and in a community that's not conducive um, to doing the kinds of things to address the cardiovascular disease risk, we're not going to make enough progress. And in fact, as I mentioned before, we're going to exacerbate some of the health disparities. So Alzheimer's disease is the, 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 the next example where, of course, the, inter, the International Organization of Alzheimer's Precision Medicine, that initiative um, put a, a cohort together and it is actually this initiative um, that uh, was the front runner of the all, uh, all of us research program. And so it is this cohort um, that began to integrate how it would look like if we use precision medicine in the context of Alzheimer's. And so if you step back just one step and say, well, what is it that influences ADRD? Then we know um, obesity, excessive alcohol use, depression, hypertension, not enough aerobic physical activity and sleep is another one that may not be on here, but that definitely has a, a, an influence on, on ADID risk. Those are all still individual, but we're beginning to transition into a factors that are influenced by where somebody lives, by where um, somebody goes to work, by where somebody um, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is living their daily, their daily life. Because then we can begin to look at, so what are the influences of um, diversity in a population? What are the influences on the economy or the economic structure and development within that community? What's the infrastructure at the neighborhood level? Um, where is the trauma and the stress um, influencing aging? Um, and where is not only the individual social capital, but the community capital? So a series of both proximal and distal factors that ultimately influence either the acceleration of ADID or a decrease in the slowing the opportunity to slow that acceleration. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this last part of my presentation focuses on something that, as Adrian mentioned, my engagement in the National Academy of Medicine, that has is all a buzz uh, around what it is that we, um, as the scientific community, really do, but more what we don't do with, with um, uh, around life expectancy. And so life expectancy in the US, uh, it is not a surprise, but it definitely now has the level of visibility that we, I have not seen before. Um, because we are currently seeing the biggest two year decline in a century. And so it stops us to think about what is it, despite all the investments that we make at the individual level, what is it that is keeping us um, not having better life expectancy? And so what I'm sharing with you is really courtesy of the work and the analysis done by Janine Buchanan, our Associate Dean for Research in the School of Public Health, comparing data for Allegheny County between 1990 and 2020 because our county ranks among the, 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 the worst. And so here is our ranking in 2020 for county adjusted mortality rates. And you could see the, the comparison. Similarly, we're looking at mortality rates for black females. See our ranking uh, at 41 out of 43. Um, and then compare that with white males. Black males, age-adjusted uh, mortality, 
39 and white males 30. So um, in both cases, always, of course, the uh, minority population uh, ranking worse, but overall we're ranking worse. Um, cardiovascular disease at 34. Age adjusted cancer mortality rate at 40. Mortality rates for uh, infants um, less than one year old. And we know maternal mortality um, is incredibly high. Then here you see the, the next age range, 20 to 64 and 65 plus. And then the opioid, um, I was um, asked over the weekend as part of the alumni weekend to uh, moderated opioid panel, and here we see where Allegheny County ranks. Accidents. Life expectancy here in Highland Park at 86 and in Larimer at 62. And so the disparities are, are you know, um, order or nose and facing a square. So where do we go both with precision medicine and precision public health? And how could we create a situation where we're leveraging um, both areas, um, especially here um, in, uh, at, in our family at the University of Pittsburgh, but here in Allegheny County um, in, uh, specifically. And so um, here's a quote from the former director from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as he says that AI and machine learning and all the things that we do with predict predictive modeling is very important, but um, without better systems to track what's really happening on the front lines, um, that's where precision public health is operational. Uh, it's, it's simply a house of cards. And so um, this is about to be published, this figure to the left, um, it's I've been um, honored to be part of implementation science and implementation research. This is in the context of uh, climate and health, but it fits um, in, in, in our situation specifically, where if we want to be successful, we co-create, um, we, we use implementation science frameworks, um, we use methods to determine how and why, and so mixed methods are, are definitely um, an area where we don't no longer um, say, well, no, we don't do mixed methods research. It's needed in this case, um, where we continue to push for uh, implementation in terms of outcomes. We continue to push for whether this is feasible or and, and whether this is acceptable um, to the communities. Um, and above all, where we integrate uh, precision medicine and precision public health to make the changes and the advancement in health in a sustainable way. And so it leads me to acknowledge um, Sam to Tony who worked with me on this and who's engaged with me in this research um, and to leave you my contact information. And I think it's about exactly the time that you wanted me to speak Adrian so that we could have a dialogue. Yeah, that was fantastic, Maureen, really uh, superb. I will open it up for questions. People can either raise their hand or they can speak up. I would love to take the first question. Um, I was gonna ask a question on the mortality curves, which are pretty um, striking, but I would like to ask you a question on the digital platform on the app you showed where someone could look up their location and look for their uh, geolocation for their exposures. Do you imagine in the future you might integrate that with their genetics so that you know people obviously with different genetics have different risks of exposure you might kind of say yeah you have the genetics that suggest you shouldn't be living here are you thinking of putting the precision medicine component into the app or just for the moment only having the uh, kind of public health measures in there so we definitely want to do that. That's exactly the, the data twin that we're hoping to do. But obviously at the individual side, there are 
there are confidentiality issues, but if a person, imagine, and I'm not a, a data guru, but if a person has their electronic health record and they have access to it, and we provide a, a way for that person to integrate that with the neighborhood, with the community profile, I think that should be possible to say, well, you know, what is it that put me at risk from a community specific uh, aspects to that lens? I know what puts me at risk at the individual level. I need to lose weight or I need to, but what puts me at risk at the community level? That's exactly where we want to go. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I thought from a privacy protection issue, it's obviously an issue, but if you do it at the person only, then it's their own data and then them not sharing it would, would be fine. Exactly. Great, I'm happy to open it up for other questions. If people want to either speak up or raise their hand, that would be fine. There is silence. Maybe I can ask you more in again then. So coming back to the mortality curves, what's the, what comes out of that then? What's been the, the possible solutions to turning those curves around then? Is there, what's the chatter about that? The solution is not necessarily at the individual level. The solution is to, is multi-pronged obviously, uh, but it's to deal with those social determinants of health. So how could we create, um, and, and I'm, I'm, this is a good opportunity to really send kudos to Lina Dastillo and the community engagement centers is how do we take care and access to care, how do we take health literacy, how do we take health education to the community rather than to wait for them to come to our Oakland campus. And so that is this embedding um, the kind of um, either stimulants to good health or taking away or redressing the, the, uh, the distal and proximal indicators um, that harm our health if we bring that kind of asset to the community, that's that's where ultimately um, we'll get we'll get victory. Um, uh, when I you know when I teach um, and I still teach, I, I did yesterday. Um, I'm always asked uh, how we explain what public health is and what prevention is, and 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 the way I put it is as prevention is very much unlike sex. There is no instant gratification. And actually, even undergrads get it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, any other questions after that great comment? From Lisa. Sure. I, I especially following on your most recent response, Maureen, um, I'll pose a question that often arises um, about the precision part of the public health intervention because so many of the uh, risk factors, the social, the public health risk factors that you mention um, would really be benefits. So avoiding a food desert, um, uh, exercise, cleaning up our water and our air and so on. So many of those would benefit any community, every community, um, so that the precision aspect um, seems in a way to dissolve a bit once we move to interventions, simply, although it's not simple, into public health. Uh, so can you give us some tools for explaining that aspect? Yeah, um, I'm glad you, you focused in on that because that's exactly not what precision public health is about. And so why would we address X if X is not what is your major point in a, in a community, the major challenge. And so I, I explicitly mentioned uh, Mayor uh, Adeni's focus on gun violence because that is a public health issue tailored to a specific community. It might be multiple communities, but it's tailored to a specific community. Um, and sometimes gun violence goes together with opioid, um, the opioid uh, overuse. Uh, and so the idea is to tailor the, the, the intervention or with, particularly with implementation science 
to the problems that are present in the community, in addition to the, the general things of poverty and education. But it is what matters and what makes a difference in the community. So if I'm interested in looking at um, environmental exposures and, and neurodevelopment in kids, but that's not the issue in the community. That's not the research we're going to bring there. That's not the intervention that's useful there. So it, it requires, and, and thank you so much for asking that question. It requires some humility on our part and saying, this might be not be your next R01, but it is what the community needs. So. Great, and Eric. Uh, so thank you for, for that great talk. I, I think it's, it's really, uh, as a, I'm, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist in the School of Medicine, um, and I, I, I like exactly what you said in the last comment. Uh, a lot of times, I may be very passionate and excited about something. I do asthma research, um, but that doesn't necessarily always match what the what the, my patients and the community that I serve are in most dire need of. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to compliment sort of that that question on the other end. Oftentimes, I, what we look as as investigators, clinician investigators, or, um, or or researchers, is not what policymakers need to be able to identify what kind of interventions might be necessary in different communities. So, how do you bridge that um, again? Right, what the community truly needs, what the investigator is is currently looking at. And also, how can we tailor our research so that we can provide policymakers and decision makers with the data that they need or, or the data that we need to provide them to convince them of what things need to be changed uh, at a broader level? Yeah, so in public health policy and politics, and I know there are experts are up among those um, of us here, are very close. And it's very difficult for us not to get involved in politics. Um, Roe versus Wade, uh, you know, needle exchange. And so those are all things that, that, that bring us very close there. But um, what matters to that policymaker is sometimes, you know, in my 20 years almost at CDC, we couldn't lobby. Um, we had to educate, and that's what it was called. So now we're, we can, right? Um, but it, it, it is important for us to take time um, as academicians, as scientists, but also as frontline public health professionals, what it is that matters for that person in their district. Um, and what happens in that district does matter to them. Um, I'll give you an example. I know there might be other questions, but I'll give you an example. And so for the longest time when I was at uh, CDC at the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, we were very worried about groundwater contamination of a defunct uh, manufacturing facility. And we went to many community meetings and we weren't making progress. And I was uh, concerned why my team wasn't making progress. So I went myself. And um, I happened to sit, uh, it was in a, a gym. I happened to sit in the gym um, with a, a older in the, uh, person who was very quiet. And at the end of the meeting, he kind of took me aside and he said, doc, you know, you are nice people from where you come from. Uh, this was a site in Florida, um, but we're not worried about this factory. What is really important to us is teenage pregnancy. Now, I didn't do teenage pregnancy, but what I did know is that I wasn't going to make any progress if I didn't address teenage pregnancy. So, so we connected um, the community with, in this case, Hersha who was doing um, training in uh, federally qualified health centers. And six months after that, you'd have to wait, six months after that, he actually took me for a walk. And he and I walked into that different facility and he opened up a manhole and he said, here for the last 25 years, when I worked at this company, I dumped all the pesticides. So oh, wow. I, I had my completed exposure pathway, but it took me addressing teenage pregnancy and waiting six months. Thank you. Ah, great example. Maureen, I want to ask you a couple of questions from the chat. One is from Amber Johnson who asks from the School of Medicine, what plans are there to incorporate pharmacogenomic data or epigenomics into your precision models? I know you've talked about that, but what do you have concrete plans on that currently? 
Um, so we, I'm hoping that we would have more in-depth conversations, Adrian, specifically with you and your team, to see how we can, epigenetic data and epigenomics is very important in the context of environmental health. And more and more we see that um, th those risk levels put people at disproportionate, in disproportionate situations. And often those burdens are either age specific or people with chronic conditions or in increasingly immunocompromised uh, individuals. So we want to include those kind of data. Um, we have to still navigate very carefully um, the personal identifiable data. And so we would have to work with communities and work with ethicists. And I'm glad that Lisa is on here, how we navigate those barriers. Um, but that's where the that's where the future is, um, particularly in environmental health, epigenetic data are critical for us to fingerprint that risk and do something about that risk. So absolutely, yes. Yeah, no, it'd be great to start that dialogue. And a second question from Emery, which I think is related and also good as well. Um, are you in partnership with the CTSI, all of us research program, PIT plus me? Will you be using the local data we've collected thus far on that as well? Um, well, Steve and I have monthly meetings. Um, we not only about our, our seed funding, but also in general, what how we can connect the data that are collected. Steve actually just mentioned that he has um, many millions of electronic health records, the identified data that we could be accessing as part of um, some of our um, uh, pilot data. And so we would like to um, work with the data that CDSI uh, collects as in, in addition to the health records with the all of us data. So that's a conversation that we're going to begin. Um, we're trying to get phase one completed this year, um, where we have at least the secondary data in hand at the community level, and then see how we then move into secondary data at the individual level before we get to primary data collection. Yeah, I do think that's a great point because one of their successes, we actually had um, a speaker in the last series um, speak about the All of Us program, and it was Stephanie Devaney. And, um, the, collection from the rural communities has really been amazing and that uh, people underrepresented in science has been really stunning compared to most of our other collections. So I think it'll be really great for that opportunity. Yeah, we, you know, particularly in the cancer area and I've been uh, in my previous position, I was the Associate Director for Population Sciences and there we had the greatest difficulty in getting by specimen banked from um, communities that not necessarily with access healthcare, whether they're in the rural areas, but particularly rural minority communities. Um, and this was all in region six down in the, in the Gulf South, uh, tremendous difficulty because of distrust. So, uh, you know, the successes that we have here locally uh, with the All of Us data is, is, is incredible and is, is very, very, will be, make a big difference in us for, uh, for us to address uh, urban rural differences. And disparities. I will quickly make a pitch then. On that point, I'll make a quick pitch in that the Pitt Biospecimen Corps, which is the largest biospecimen corps on campus, which has 800,000 biospecimens, is directly linked to electronic health record and so by zip code. So we can isolate. So I work with a, uh, I don't know if anyone's on the line, but I work with a group in the Cancer Center, which identified lung cancers in a region where there's high radon exposure to look for specific genetic signatures in those cancers potentially due to the radon exposure from those individuals in that geolocation. So I think nowadays with these digital tools, you can do so much more, like you said, this transdisciplinary science, I think it's gonna be um, you know, super exciting. I think that's great. And we should talk more, Steve and I um, will have a conversation about what's next after this round of funding. So that's good, that's good timing for that discussion. Fantastic, any other, I don't see any other hands up, any other questions? If not, I would like to thank Maureen once more. I will clap in, on, on behalf of everyone that's on the call, as always. And uh, thank you, Maureen, for the talk. This was really illuminating.